In 1872, Jules Verne wrote his immortal tale, Around the World in 80 Days. He created a phrase which represented then and represents today all that is exotic and unusual about the world of travel. Over 110 years later, Cunard proudly continues that tradition with the greatest ship afloat, the Queen Elizabeth II, flagship of the Cunard Line, 67,000 tons and 13 stories high, the last great liner of the seas. It was Samuel Cunard, born in Halifax, Nova Scotia, on November the 21st, 1787, who won the contract from the British Admiralty to operate a transatlantic mail service between the ports of Liverpool and Halifax. With this contract, Samuel Cunard saw his first ship come into service, the 1,150-ton paddlewheel steamer Britannia, and the first transatlantic mail service with 63 passengers on board, including Samuel Cunard, left Liverpool on the 4th of July, 1840. 125 years later, the keel was laid for the greatest ship in the world, Queen Elizabeth II. Launched by Her Majesty the Queen on the 20th of September, 1967, QE2's maiden voyage from Southampton to New York was on the 2nd of May, 1969. QE2 was originally designed for transatlantic travel and cruising. Having completed 10 world cruises and steamed over two and a half million miles, QE2 has traveled more than twice the distance of the previous queens, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth. And just as these great ships played a vital part in the Second World War years, transporting millions of Allied troops across the Atlantic, QE2 also fulfilled a fighting role by transporting 3,000 troops in May 1982, which brought about the culmination of the Falklands conflict. But now QE2 continues to act as a silent ambassador to Britain and always receives the most tumultuous welcome at the many exotic ports and capitals she visits throughout the world. several changes in her paintwork, but now QE2 sells resplendent in the traditional canard colors. Truly the grandest lady on the seas today, and most certainly the greatest ship in the world. Since the development and increase in air travel, the QE2, the last of the great transatlantic liners, has maintained the same aura and nostalgia that has been evident in all the canard ships and the previous queens. QE2 has had to become more of a floating leisure resort than just a floating hotel. However, she still maintains the ultimate in cuisine and service and also boasts the finest wine cellars afloat. The exciting contrast of traveling on this vessel is that a passenger has the opportunity of becoming fully involved in the myriad of leisure and entertainment activities, or should they prefer, simply relax and watch the world pass by. Like any resort, careful planning and a lot of personnel 
are needed for QE2 to perform smoothly and efficiently. QE2 has a crew of almost 1,000 persons, catering for the needs of up to 1,800 passengers. So sit back and relax as we take a look behind the scenes of the complex planning and operation in the various departments with the senior personnel that ensure Queen Elizabeth II maintains her first-class standards throughout the year in the Grand Canard tradition. Welcome aboard the greatest ship in the world. This is to advise all persons not sailing in Queen Elizabeth II that they should proceed ashore immediately as the gangway is about to be landed. This gangway is situated on the port side of two deck midships. Doug Wilson, the security officer on board, and I'm responsible for the ship's security and safety. The reason bridge and engine room visits have been curtailed is because in these troubled times, the ship is not immune to outside threats, and generally security is tighter worldwide. Ashore, in a shopping precinct or a hotel, if we have a threat, we can easily move the people to the street. On board, this is a little more difficult. Hello, I'm Ian Taylor, first officer navigator of Queen Elizabeth II. I'm now going to take you for a short tour of inspection of the wheelhouse to give you an insight into the workings of the bridge. Here at the front of the wheelhouse we have our primary navigation controls. They're so positioned so that we can see what we're doing whilst we drive the ship. Starting here at this edge of the console we have the coxswain's logbook in which hourly recordings are made of the ship's course to steer, the engine speed, and the weather conditions. Moving along, we have the engine telegraph buttons. These buttons perform the same function that the old traditional lever telegraph used to perform, in that we select the engine direction and speed required, press the appropriate button, which rings down in the engine room, the order is acknowledged and the machinery is set in motion. Next we have a communication system which links up to the mooring positions 
as a backup to our handheld walkie-talkie sets and a system which enables us to talk directly to the engine turbine control room. A little further along we have the direct line speaker down to the captain's bedroom and day room and here we have the VHF radio communication equipment which we use for short range communications, harbour work mainly, tugs, pilots, coast guard, intership, short line of sight communications. Not to be confused with the main radio equipment situated down below in the main radio room. In the centre of the console we have the steering tiller override position, an emergency switch which enables us to override the steering systems, both main and auxiliary, so that in an emergency we can put the ship's helm hard over to port or starboard and take rapid evasive action. A little further along we have the ship's speed through the water indicator currently showing some 28 and a half knots and just below we have the bow thruster controls which enable us to operate the machinery built into the forward part of the ship which assists us in docking and undocking allowing us to push the bows from port to starboard. It's like having a tug built into the fore part of the ship, if you like. The last piece of equipment on the forward console, the whistle controls. The button here enables us to sound off the main whistles on the mainmast or the fog whistle right up forward on the foredeck. we regard as one of the most invaluable aids to navigation, the ship's radar. You can think of it as an electronic extension to the human eye. Radar enables us to see in the dark in weather conditions which would otherwise render us blind, falling rain, snow, fog. In other words, we're effectively able to fly in cloud. Over here we have the two master units they both perform the same function. The only difference is that they transmit on different wavelengths. It enables us to have a separate opinion should there be any, any doubt as to the information from one radar. In front here, we have a slave display which enables us to take the best of both worlds, the best of information from each of the master displays, present our information here, and we can select at the touch of a button which rate master display we want to take our information from. Here we have the anti-collision radar display unit which enables us to take information from either of the two master displays. The information shown is the same in essence as that displayed on the master units except that here we have an electronic box of tricks, a computer assisted plotting device which enables us to obtain target information more quickly and efficiently than we were able to do in the old days by means of a stopwatch and plotting sheet. Right, here we have the working chart table and this is the position from which we monitor our progress, update our position, keep track of uh, the direction we're heading in and various aids to navigation starting here with the Doppler log which gives us our speed through the water here the Loran and Decker, which are radio location systems. Valuable aids for navigation, but limited in their use by range. And here we have the old faithful, the sextant. A device which enables you to establish your position through observation of the sun and stars. Here above the chart table we have the sextant's modern day successor, the satellite navigator. It performs the same function in that it establishes our position, but in this case through electronic observation of artificial satellites. The big advantage is that we can make these observations night or day in any weather conditions worldwide, and it enables us to establish a fix with an accuracy down to within a couple of hundred feet. To assist with navigation in harbour areas and inland waterways throughout the world, we engage the services of pilots for their local expert knowledge. 
Although it may be argued that we know best how to handle our own ship, the advice of a good pilot is very comforting, rather like that of a ground controller talking an aircraft in from his final approach. In most cases, pilotage is compulsory, but even so, the pilot acts in a strictly advisory capacity, whilst the captain, firmly in command, still has the final say. The pilot will join us at the outer approaches to a harbour area and may be embarked from launch, tugboat or helicopter, depending on weather conditions and distance from the berth. Now, having covered the operational features from the bridge, we move down one deck and into the world of long-range communications. Welcome to the radio room. My name's Alan Holmes. I'm the chief radio officer, and we have a total staff of five. This is the receiving room, where all the receivers and teleprinters and the ComSat terminal, the computer, the word processor, they're all here. We have another room containing transmitters, which is up nearer the funnel from where all our aerials uh, are erected. We're uh, in charge of all kinds of communications from the old-fashioned Morse code, which we still use every day, through telex, through FM, and into satellites these days. We have a uh, satellite terminal here, through which goes um, telex. At the moment, we're, uh, we're in the data field. We're transmitting large amounts of data from the ship to our offices in New York and in Southampton. And this speeds up the process of telex, whereas a telex might once have taken an hour to send, we can now speed the whole process up to two and a half minutes or thereabouts. So through the telephone operator on the ship, we can connect you with any telephone number in the world by direct dial using this equipment. We're using it more and more. It is slightly more expensive, but it is fast, reliable, and clear. What you're looking at now is a British computer and monitor which we connect through the satellite equipment to another computer in England. This computer contains lots of news, weather, sports, financial information, and we can take a whole newspaper for the ship in about six minutes. We get through quite a lot of information in one day. We look after weather forecasts, iceberg bulletins and during the iceberg season, and uh, we're constantly uh, on the alert for anybody else who's in trouble. My name is Bob Arnott, and I am captain and master of Queen Elizabeth II. As such, my main role is the safety of the ship and the safety and well-being of the crew and passengers on board, and, of and the safe navigation of getting the ship from A to B. I'm also the company's top representative and spokesman on board for all matters of uh, public relations. And I have on board also the staff captain, who is my second in command. And he is responsible for uh, the welfare and discipline of the crew. Also, the machinery on board is 110,000 horsepower, of which the, is the chief engineer's domain. I'm John Chillingworth, and I'm chief engineer on QE2. As chief engineer, I'm on a par with the captain, although the captain has the overall responsibility for the safety of the ship. QE2 is the most complex ship afloat, and I am responsible for everything of a technical nature. To assist me in running the ship, I have a department of 33 engineer and electrical officers, 26 mechanics, 4 plumbers, 8 carpenters, and 35 assistant mechanics. That's a total of 106. Now let me show you our control rooms and some of our machinery spaces. This is the main control room, and it is here that the engineers monitor the status of all machinery.
This console houses the control systems for the main alternators. We have three turbo alternators, which can each generate 5.5 megawatts at 3,300 volts and 60 cycles. This voltage is distributed to various electrical substations around the ship, which provides various voltages from 440 volts to 110 volts in your cabin. The load on each alternator can be controlled by pressing either the raise or lower button on the console. On this console, we have the control panel for the boilers, which includes an up-to-date steam atomization combustion system. The three boilers produce steam at 850 pounds per square inch at a temperature of 950 degrees Fahrenheit. QE2's maximum service speed is 28 and a half knots. On the far side of the console, we have the control gear for the four stabilizers and two bow thrusters. In this age of computers, the main control room has been fitted with a sophisticated system which, at the touch of a button, displays over 400 temperature and pressure readings around the ship, as well as any alarm conditions. Situated directly outside the main control room are the turbo alternators, which are driven by steam turbines and generate the electricity for the ship. The boiler furnace houses seven burners. At QE2's maximum speed, the ship consumes 550 tons of fuel per day at a cost of $110,000, which makes QE2's annual fuel bill in the region of $28 million. QE2 has two propeller shafts, each of which are 250 foot long. The propeller shaft drives a six-bladed propeller, which weighs 36 tons and is 29 foot in diameter. In this part of the machinery spaces, we have our sprinkler system pressure tank. Should a sprinkler head be activated, water is immediately supplied from this tank. The main engine turbines are operated from the turbine control room. The status of the main engines are monitored by the engineer on watch. This is the safety control room. It is here that all safety systems are monitored. Also, all fuel, ballast and bilge pumping are controlled from here. On the alarm board, all sprinkler and smoke alarms are indicated, as well as the status of all watertight doors. As chief engineer, it is my responsibility to ensure the safe and efficient running of the technical aspect of the ship. But as with all floating hotels, QE2 has a hotel manager. Hello, I'm John Duffy, hotel manager on board this floating resort. Of the total crew, approximately 770 are within my department and answerable to me through my departmental heads. These heads of department are responsible for various sections and report to me on a daily basis. The senior hotel officers are the food and beverage manager, the executive chef, the purser, the purser accounts, the cruise director and the assistant hotel manager hygiene.
very dark executive shed and with a full amount of passengers and crew can serve anything up to 11,000 meals per day. I have a staff of 141 plus five officer chefs which are located in each of my kitchens and are directly responsible to me. The staff comprises of butchers, bakers and confectioners and all personnel required for the preparation and presentation of all meals. I am responsible for the day-to-day -day menu, menu planning. Also, the forecasting of the amounts and stores required for the service. I always check the stores before they are brought on board the ship for quality and freshness. They are stored on seven and eight decks in separate refrigerated areas. Some of the quantities of food used on a typical five-day voyage would include 4,500 pounds of beef, 1,000 pounds of prime lamb, 1,200 pounds of chickens, also 550 honeydew melon, 10,000 oranges, and 1,000 pounds of butter and unbelievably 36,000 fresh eggs. Four to 36 pounds of caviar in any one day. Incidentally, Cunard are the world's single biggest purchaser of caviar. Danish pastries and rolls are freshly prepared before each meal. We also have to cater for certain diet requests, like salt-free, diabetics, children, and kosher. We also prepare special orders for passengers' requests, which may be anything from a crown of lamb to a flambe dessert, or a tray of canopies for a private cocktail party. food, QE2 also has the most comprehensive wine cellars afloat. It's quite easy with all the fine cuisine and wine for passengers to gain a few extra pounds during the voyage. It comes as no surprise that QE2 has a comprehensive health and fitness center to help lose some of the calories gained during the voyage and the Golden Door Spa at Sea from California has a fitness program to suit everybody's requirements ranging from a fully equipped -to gymnasium, massage and sauna facilities, aerobics, water exercises, and to end the day, a relaxing dip in the hot tub. My name's Mike Constant, the purser. I'm in charge of the purser's office where we have uh, six girls and two officers and take care of all passenger inquiries, safety deposit for the safety of valuables, immigration formalities, custom formalities, onward travel uh, arrangements and all the baggage on board. Also, I'm responsible for the housekeeping on board, the tele telephone exchange with the four telephonists and the night telephone operator and a full printer shop. I'm also responsible for all the cabins on board, all 942 of them, 
And these cabins range from small inboard cabin singles up into the first class penthouse suites with the balconies and beautiful appointments. so many cabins and so many passengers that we carry, the laundry really has a very heavy load and thousands of sheets and towels are laundered daily. Dr. Nigel Roberts and I'm the ship's principal medical officer. I'm proud to say that here on board QE2 we can claim without any fear of contradiction at all that we have the finest medical facility of any ship afloat anywhere in the world. We like to think that we can equal this with a standard of medicine and of service that we can unquestionably rate as second to none. Our level of achievement can best be illustrated by our results. And as an example of this, we can probably claim to have the highest survival rate for in medical emergencies, such as acute coronary thrombosis, of any establishment or location anywhere in the world. That is outside of being in a hospital at the time of the incident, of course. Our practice here on board is made up of nearly 3,000 potential patients, which includes over 1,800 passengers and more than 1,000 crew members. In order for us to be able to deal with these sort of numbers, we have a department of very highly trained medical personnel, which includes, uh, when we're at our full complement, such as on a world cruise, in addition to myself, another medical officer, we have four nursing sisters, which incidentally is a term not related to religious orders. In the States, uh, they would be referred to as head nurses. The nursing sisters are qualified in emergency room techniques, in cardiac uh, care, in operating room or operating theatre as we call it, techniques, as well as in general nursing. When we're on a world cruise, we also carry our own dentist on board. And an additional extra, which you perhaps wouldn't expect on a ship, is a physiotherapist. Uh, to complete the team, we have uh, a medical petty officer who is our dispenser, come radiographer, uh, come lag technician. And the backup and support of this group, we have two medical attendants. The equipment, the facilities and the staff that we have available allow us to deal with literally any form of medical or surgical emergency which could possibly arise at sea. In fact, we're probably better equipped to deal with these problems than many of the islands or the countries that you might visit with us around the world. The medical facilities are surprisingly comprehensive. We have, of course, this passenger consulting area which comprises the waiting room and office. The hospital itself is down below at the more stable location of sea level midships. In the hospital are located the crew consulting and examination rooms. Next door to this area is the dispensary where we maintain a full cross-section of all categories of drugs. Being a registered vaccination centre, we also carry a full stock of all vaccines required for world travel. Further along, we have our X-ray department, which is used principally for trauma and for chest examinations. This comprises the lead-lined X-ray room itself, complete with bucky table and the dark room. Next, we have a small laboratory, where we can perform minor investigative procedures and where, incidentally, we can also carry out a routine daily check of the ship's drinking water. A room which, to most passengers surprised, is used in its principal function several times a year is our operating theatre, 
or operating room as it is called in America. In here we have the full equipment and capabilities for any major surgical emergency. However, the majority of the time, of course, it is used for minor surgical procedures. Also kept closely on hand in the theater is the cardiac emergency equipment. From here, we boast of being able to cover all cardiac emergencies anywhere in the ship within two minutes of being reported. As mentioned, we carry our own dentist on board during certain voyages, who maintains the dental health of the crew and is available for whatever acute problems might arise amongst the passengers, in addition to any routine dentistry which may be required. Our physiotherapist covers every aspect of her field and has her own department within the hospital, which is equipped for all varieties of treatment. In the midst of these areas, we have a small treatment and dressings room from where the senior nursing sister runs the hospital. Finally, behind these rooms, we have the hospital wards themselves. Here we have a total of 14 beds divided into five wards comprising male and female passenger wards, crew ward, isolation ward, and a coronary care unit equipped with cardiac monitor and full intensive and resuscitative equipment. My name is Bob Payne's crew director working on board QE2. I've been with the Cunard line for the past 10 years, four and a half of which have been working as a cruise director. The job itself primarily involves the direction of all the leisure and entertainment facilities, plus the organization of the public relation facilities for the press and the media. I have under my command or due restriction a staff of 60 personnel, which includes 12 crew staff members, six dancers, 25 musicians, a host of instructors, entertainers and lecturers and of course with all this the job is an extremely challenging one. But the rich rewards are such that one has a chance to meet some very interesting passengers, of course the entertainers and lecturers themselves, and one has, one has the satisfaction of knowing that if one provides an exciting daily program then one keeps the passenger happy and occupied and hopefully entices them back again on the greatest ship in the world. Some of the areas that are available for leisure and passenger services include the children's area, the library, the card room, the crew staff office for any leisure activity inquiry, plus the facility of our video library for the use in the video viewing room, which is adjacent to the latest project for QE2, the Computer Learning Center. Dance classes in the double down room. The kennels, where recently two cats and a duck went around the world. The 525 seater theater, is used for the showing of the latest current releases in films and, of course, entertainment. Other leisure activities include Bridge in the Queen's Room, Arts and Crafts in the Double Down Bar Aft. Here we see the theatre bar with cocktail music and of course, the double down room featuring such greats as the Jolos Orchestra. Of course, one of the highlights during any voyage is the captain's cocktail party, where passengers have a chance to meet him and of course, make some new friends in this exclusive formal atmosphere. Some of the other services on board QE2 include Hair and Beauty by Steiners of London, the Players Club Casino, operated by the Sportsman of London. QE2 also has a large shopping area, including the latest in fashion, jewellery and duty-free items.
Another recent addition to QE2 is a unique branch of Harrods of Knightsbridge. She even has her own florists on board. QE2 has a vast area of deck space, equivalent to two football fields. QE2 has a golf pro on hand to improve your swing and drive, its own paddle tennis court, table tennis area, and a chance to do some skeet or trap shooting. Her four swimming pools include two indoor and two outdoor. And there is always fun and games in the outside pool when the crossing the line ceremony takes place. Another latest addition to the QE2 is the Magadome Centre. This is an area with a sliding roof that can be opened during the day, but by night it becomes a sophisticated nightclub, which features special themes, fashion shows, bands and disco. Your host in this exciting area is Stuart Barton, who also has his own radio program, where he interviews some of the stars that entertain on board. lovely dancers, sweet elegance. Some of the celebrities that have recently appeared on QE2 include George Burns, Jack Jones, The Platters, Iris Williams, Charles Aznavour, Diane Carroll, Patti LuPone, Bert Whedon, Alan Stewart, Francis Yip, and Vince Hill. The tradition of excellence begun by Samuel Kennard continues, and today the future of regular transatlantic travel rests solely with the Queen Elizabeth II. Beyond QE2 lies only conjecture and a dream. Perhaps there will be a technological advance that will make a new great passenger ship possible. It's a remote likelihood, but a dream ship lovers like to keep. As QE2 slowly maneuvers into her home port of Southampton, England, passengers will arrive richer than they left. For riches should not be measured in money and possessions, but rather in experiences and memories. <laughs>